Okay, our last speaker today is going to be Ralph Kapelhoff. And Ralph is going to speak about something that uh, just about everybody forgets to think about when they're joining a startup. Um, we've talked about a lot of parameters, but one of the most critical is how do you get your money out of it after you've put all this of yourself and all this sacrifice into it? So perhaps the most important part, which I why we put it at the end. <laughs> Thanks, Ralph. Yeah, hopefully it's not too much of a downer. Um, <laughs> <laughs> okay, I'm, I'm a, a graduate from 86. I, uh, I started my career like Mark. We uh, joined Procter & Gamble at the same time. Wonderful place to learn about how to be a manager. Uh, after that, I was fortunate enough to join Michael's startup and spent most of the time during from the 90s to 2000 in a startup that uh, it got larger and smaller and larger and smaller. It, uh, startups go through many phases. Uh, but they're all great. And then I, I we ran out of money, basically, and we sold the division that I was running to uh, Rockwell Automation. And that brought me back around, back into corporate America. Uh, Rockwell is kind of a medium-sized company with 20,000 employees. Uh, I did my time there, uh, acquired six companies while I was there. Uh, then I moved on to a company called Ariva. Uh, it's a company out of Paris. You may not have hold it, heard of it before, but uh, we write the software that controls most of the US power grid. Uh, we generate a set point to the, the power grid every two seconds, and, and that pretty much controls whether you have lights or not. Um, so I'm going to talk a little bit about that. I've, I've been more involved in the last 10 years in acquiring companies, and that's why I'm talking about exit plans, because uh, a lot of times I'm the exit plan uh, for the company. Every company kind of has one of these two business models, and this is the complete list. You're either <laughs> built to last or built to sell. And it's very important when you get in a company that you figure out from the owner of that company which they are. Companies that are built to last go all, all over the place. Little dry cleaners, little corner stores, big Procter & Gamble's. These are companies that are designed to last forever. Right? There's other companies that are built to sell. Most of the startups you've heard here are built to sell. And they're either selling to the public, they're selling to the banks, they're selling to the venture capital community, but they are built to sell. Now, how can you tell the difference? There's a couple of signs. Okay, you talk to people in a build to last company. They have job descriptions. They have governance processes. Generally, they work on there's a lot of punishment for failure and very little reward for success. You get a company like that, you're probably dealing with a build to last company. Not going to be as much fun. You get a lot of experience because they, you know, they, they use their working capital to fund their operating expenses. They have all the things that, that we were mentioning here, formalized training plans, 401ks. There's even some that still have pensions, although that's probably going to be something for the history book soon. And they're a great place to get a lot of experience. Then you get the built to sell companies. High team spirit. Okay, better ask to, for forgiveness than uh, ask for permission. That's the kind of attitude you see. Operating working capital. You've heard all of the people here talk about cash, right? Generally, a built to sell company is using more capital than it generates from its own operations. That's why they're always talking to venture capitalists. That's why they're talking to banks. You've always got to finance the operating working capital to grow a small company and eventually be able to sell it. And that's where you get into stock options and equity stakes and all that. Now, given what you've heard today, where are you going to get the experience to run a major division? You know, languishing for 10 years in the back design office of some big engineering firm is not going to set you up to run a major operation in that company. You will be there until you die. Why do exit plans matter? Um, the main reason is because most startups have uh, a lot of their operating working capital comes from outside, you eventually have to have something called a liquidity event, right? which is where you eventually have to give these people back their money. Sometimes those people are the owner. Sometimes those people are the banks. There's four big Ds that you got to deal with, and particularly when you're talking about small companies, the death of the owner. This is a really big deal. You might have a little company that's worth two, three, four, five million dollars, but suddenly it gets to be worth hundred million dollars, two hundred million dollars, and the owner dies. How do you pay for the estate? You're probably not generating enough cash to be able to do that. You have disability of one of the key employees that makes the whole place run. The top sales guy gets into some kind of violent car crash. You have a divorce. Suddenly you've got to carve the company in half. Again, little five million dollar company, not a big deal. $100 million company, very big deal. Coming up with $50 million in cash is not an easy event. And in a nasty divorce, all kinds of things can be done that causes the company to be liquidated for almost nothing. Departure, 
Um, and departure happens in various ways. Since, since I'm more involved in buying companies than, than, than uh, running the smaller companies, we're generally looking. We have uh, a group of people that run around. We look for owners that are getting old, that uh, have expressed an interest in getting out of the business, that haven't got a really good exit plan, but uh, you know, they need to go do something else. And we find those people and we buy their companies. Um, and you need this because uh, if you look during 2006, about 96% of the 670,000 companies started in the U.S. had less than 20 employees. So a lot of good companies getting started, and that was a good year for companies to get started. Of course, in that same year, 573,000 companies with less than 20 employees uh, went out of business. So the reality is exit plans are very important for startups because there's a large probability you're going to have to execute on them. So what happens in an exit plan? Okay, the default is you liquidate. Liquidate means you sell all the furniture and the paper and the pencil pads and everything that's left over, turn the company, whatever assets it has, into a bag of money, and then figure out what happens to the bag of money. This is what happens to a lot of retail organizations, but it happens to you know, engineering startups and software companies. And only about 9% of those are bankruptcies. So bankruptcy is a forced liquidation where you're paying off the, the creditors. So what happens to the other 12%? There's a couple of ways you can create some level of continuity for the company. You can sell it to your employees. You can sell it to the other co-owners or family members that are co-owners. You can sell it to outsiders, or you can sell it to the public. Those are your real options. Let's look at a few of the probabilities of these options coming through. Okay, the probability of, uh, and, and kind of the most likely one if we take them in order, the buy-sell agreement. This is a, where you have an owner that, that has identify the probability that something nasty would happen, like they'll die or they'll have a divorce, and they create a buy-sell option. And it's basically an insurance policy that allows you to create some level of continuity through a death or a divorce type scenario. This is a good thing. Now as the employee, there's no real payout associated with that. It creates a continuity for the business and the business keeps running through. The other one is you can sell to an outsider, and I'll talk about that one next because that's the one I'm most involved in. But about 3% of the companies do manage to make it successful enough that a large multinational type company comes and buys them. And again, this is a normal mode of operation. Large companies have a lot of capital. They have a lot of processes. You're able to roll things out across the world very quickly, but innovation tends to not be there. Um, big companies aren't set up to do the level of innovation that you're gonna see in a small company. What big companies can do is they can sit around and watch, and they can watch 100 small companies, figure out the three that really made it, and buy them. And they're willing to pay the owners of those companies hundreds of millions of dollars in an effort to avoid the 97 companies' worth of effort that they didn't have to do because they could do the buyout. Then you get the uh, MBO. This is the, the leverage buyout MBO. They, these are very rare. Um, roughly one in 1,000 companies manages to pull it off. Uh, in the absence of a buy-sell agreement, there generally isn't enough capital to be able to do this. And then there's the infamous IPO. Okay, your chance of being hit by lightning is roughly the same as your chance of being part of an IPO of an organization. One in 2,000. So those are, your, those are your plans. Now those, you know, what I showed you on that slide was what, what it is for the owner. Then there's the employee. And generally when you're in a startup, you're kind of in between. You know, particularly if you have an equity stake, you may not be the owner, but you have some substantial equity stake. You're not really just an employee. Uh, if you go public, that's the cleanest one. Uh, generally if you have stock options or an equity position, it's very clearly laid out in your equity um, contract what happens when the company goes public. So in the one in 2,000 chance, the I got hit by lightning chance, it's clear. Then it gets a little muddy after that. Um, if you sell to a major, and I buy a lot of companies, um, your stock options may or may not have value in the event that you get bought by another company. When we start getting in the negotiations with these smaller companies, you know, we're generally talking to just the owner or the major shareholder. And everybody else, there's a discussion about what happens to their equity stake. And it may or may not be valued, and it may or may not be paid out. A lot of it depends on how it's been set up at the front, right? Because the idea is it's a business continuity event. Going public, selling to a major, buy-sell agreement are all continuity events that may or may not result in a payout for the equity owners. The buy-sell, of course, that's your organized mechanism for valuing the business and, and having continue. And there's generally nothing associated with that for the individual employees. And then there's the liquidation, the 9 in 10 chance, right? And in that case, the business ceases to operate, all the assets are sold off, and what do you leave with? Right? What you leave with is a lot of experience. <laughs> it's not that bad. 
it's not bad. It's not bad because uh, there's, the experience is worth a lot more than money in many cases. Um, you know, you, a lot of people say, well, how can you tell if a startup can succeed? You know, give me five or ten tips. The reality is it's almost impossible. You know, Harvard Business Review, all these guys have started up, you know, what makes an innovator, what makes a successful startup. You know, if you look at Small Business Association, 33% of all startups fail within two years, 56 in the first four, reaching over 80 in the first 10 years. And the failure rate's about the same for companies less than 20 and less than 500 employees. So even the mid-sized ones that you consider pretty stable, they fail at exactly the same rate. Uh, even the big companies, the S&P 500, about 10% of those guys fall off the radar every decade. Right? And every one of these companies was started by really talented individuals, really committed individuals that really believed that they had what it took to do it. Okay, So you're kind of taking a chance with every startup that you go into, whether it's really going to make it to the big money. One in 2,000 is the best shot you're going to have at an IPO. Stand outside and get hit by lightning, it's the same thing. So what's your decision? Um, the first thing is when you get to a company, you've got to find out what their exit plan is. Ask them what the end point looks at. You know, Mark said, six reactors, done, six plants, right? That's the kind of clarity you need from the owners. If the owners are waffling, like, ah, I don't know, maybe I'm going to run this thing in the ground, or maybe I'm going to grow it up and sell it, but I'm not really sure, you know, that's not going to be a very good place to work. You want to know where you're heading. Um, and then you've got to ask the owner, do you know how to handle these four Ds? What happens if your wife divorces you? Have you thought through the basics of how this place runs if something happens to you? And if they don't have good answers, maybe you can help them with it. Or maybe you want to reconsider whether this is a place you want to take risk. Because the risk is inherently there. Joining a startup has a statistical risk that there's nothing you can do about. Uh, and then you've got to talk about what's your cut under these different plans. And make sure you don't get all wound up about the 1 in 2,000 chance of an IPO. Make sure the other scenarios are covered in your agreement with that company. Then the other thing is you've got to figure out your own exit plan. Clearly the owner will have an exit plan. It's very important for you to also have an exit plan. Um, one thing is make sure you're not completely 100%. Unless you own the business, make sure you continue to fund things like 401ks and life insurance and all that. Right? You don't want to get to the point that the only way you can survive is if the company survives. It makes for a very stressful situation if you're not the owner and you have to take an action to leave or the business fails and now you're sitting there with nothing. The other one is decide when you have enough experience. Decide when you are at the point where you've gotten everything you think you can get out of the company. You know, the discussion about find the Dumbledore, find the Hagrid. You got to find these guys in the company, get what you can out of them, but eventually you might get to the point where there's not, not a lot more to get. Now, most of what you're trying to do is fill the holes in your resume and your skill set. So the value of the small company experience is disproportionately high for the people in this room because you have very little. You basically have your degree and your summer position. This is an opportunity to learn a lot. Um, this is the organization I run right now. Um, this is the percentage of the world's electricity flow that is governed by our software. Um, and it's a relatively large amount. We run a very large group of R&D centers in five continents. But I get here by doing stuff like this. You know, in a startup, you're going to get to negotiate with Fortune 500 companies. You're going to get to start a subsidiary in a foreign country. Learn how to sell yourself. Learn how to sell your product. Learn how to deal with salespeople. Sit on the executive board of the group. Talk about real strategy. Strategy that could cause you to not make payroll in a month. These are very interesting discussions. Teach peers in your industry directly. Interact with them one-on-one -on -one where they challenge you, you challenge them back. Drive the leading edge of innovation. These are the kind of experiences you can work for a big company for 50 years and not get. And you can get them all in the first two years in a small company. Right, these are all pictures of me and Michael's company, and that's the kind of experience you can get. Because if you're in it only for the money, you will probably never get very good at what you're doing, and you're probably going to be very disappointed. If the exit plan is all you're focused on, and the exit plan is only the 1 in 2,000 chance of an IPO, you're not going to have a happy life. And as our uh, favorite chemical engineering friend is, life is tough, but fortunately not too long. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs>